The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Perfect. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second day of our first um, uh, virtual mini conference with NARC. And uh, our first day, I think, went pretty well. Uh, lots of good conversation. Um, so we're glad that you're all back with us today. Um, as you may recall from the emails that you received, we're also having uh, the National uh, NARC's first ever photo contest. Uh, you may recall when we do our annual conference and exhibition, you know, we usually have the achievement and leadership awards uh, at that time. So this is going to replace that since this is just a different time in all of our lives. And so we're going to do something different uh, for this uh, virtual conference. Although we won't be having the formal awards, uh, we still wanted to celebrate all the amazing work that everybody is doing. And let's face it, uh, the things we're having to do now, a uh, little bit more of a challenge dealing with pandemics, dealing with uh, protests, the economy, people out of work. Um, but we, uh, but actually it's a challenge that really makes us step up to the plate and see where we can do the most good. So, you know, it's a good thing, bad thing kind of thing. It's what I would call bittersweet. Um, but through these photos, I think you're gonna see firsthand some of the truly remarkable work uh, what our NARC members are doing. There were 39 photo submissions and 15 organizations uh, from 15 organizations. So it really was hard to narrow it down to six winners because in my books, you're all winners. But we had to come on and pick out what we felt were the best six. I want you to know that all the photos will be distributed electronically after the conference so you can look at them uh, further. And many of you may have seen them yesterday morning uh, uh, as we were waiting for the conference to begin or in between sessions. But before we, but before we reveal, I, I have a commercial. No, not really. <laughs> but before we reveal that, there we go, there's my commercial. Before we reveal the photo contest, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and celebrate Shatan Shah after 46 years, 46 years, Shatan, at the Green River Area Development District. Jatan has retired. He retired May 1st. How exciting, Jatan. He started as an environmental engineer in 1973 and then became his role, began his role as executive director in 1987. So you were executive director then for 33 years. Is my math correct? You're exactly right. Yes. Well, obviously. We know that you did a great job. Your region obviously knew you did a great job and your staff did too. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been there for 33 years. Uh, um, the photo taken here is from the drive-by retirement party. Uh, yep, it's a different time in 2020. That was thrown for him by members of the community and the grad region. We're there so we excited we for you, Shatan. Go ahead and Take some time to give a few words. Well, I, no, I think there was a technical lesson uh, prior to I think there is an echo, so I need to either do something anyway. Uh, that yes, uh, NARC is uh, you know one of the dearest uh, organizations that I have been involved for over four decades or so. And I was thinking when they asked me to make some comments this morning that my first NARC annual conference. Oh. If you if you could even recognize, was in 1975 in Hollywood, uh, Florida. I was 28 years old, and I was uh, I was attending that as a, as a panelist to make a presentation about the regional capital improvement you know, project that uh, Grad had been given a demonstration from EDA. So um, that you know, nice. The rest of the story, I believe, almost attended every single you know, conference and grad 
my board and my staff all over the years been very strong supporters of NAR. Uh, I'm fortunate to have you know two of my former, I guess I said my, I'm so grads, uh, board of directors had been the past president of the NARC, uh, you know, Jim Townsend and Bob Howard. Along with that, there are quite a few numerous board members serving on the NARC board over the years. And I was lucky and fortunate. And thanks to my colleagues at the NARC executive directors uh, and the family to allow me to serve, I believe, twice as the EDC chairperson and also uh, serving on the board for many, many years. So it's been a lot of great memories. Uh, and a lot of accomplishments. You know, NARC should always, you know, uh, you know, kind of pat on their back as far as you know, starting and keeping the regional movement and, and planning and and, and uh, you know and, and local governments alive. And you know, uh, the 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 con the topic today and some of the things I've seen yesterday and today is also testimonial. You know, in a times like in the uh, you know the racial issues along with the COVID nineteen pandemic, there is no better solution for the vehicle than utilizing regional you know, planning and cooperation and the resources. You know? So my hat's up to all of you. Uh, and again, I say, uh, you know, I'm so been honored that you asked me to make some comments. I wish I was uh, there in person, like all of us do, at the not our annual conference. Uh, at least we could have been, uh, you know, thanks to Kathleen, we could have been in Detroit and have a great time. However, uh, you know, everything has a you know, time and a place and uh, I wish you best of luck and uh, hopefully, you know, Brad would continue to be an active, you know, partner in the NARC. And Marge, thank you and also thank the board members at NARC along with the staff, great staff, none, mm -hmm. second to none when you talk about the regional solution, regional planning and ever changing as the time changes too. So again, thank you and thank you for allowing me to make some comments. Jitan, um, I couldn't agree with you more regarding our staff and the membership, and um, you are a reflection of that membership, the leadership that you provided uh, during the time that you were with NARC was, was terrific, you know, uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's very memorable, and um, you made a difference for NARC, and we want to thank you, and we wish you the very best. Happy retirement. Have a great trip to California. And you guys have a great conference and uh, you know, safe, be safe. And hopefully, you know, uh, we'll get a chance in the future to at least uh, Absolutely. You know, so thank you person. Absolutely. Thanks, Shatan. Thank you for all you have done. We'll now run through this year's NARC photo contest winners. Here we go. Uh, up first, we have a submission from the Lahive. Valley Planning Commission in Allentown, Pennsylvania. LVPC traveled across its region with the Blackboard Cube for three years as a part of a larger public engagement program for their regional plan. The young woman in this photo was among the 5,000 who attended the Blues, Brews, and Barbecue, sounds good to me, event in downtown Allentown. Participants like the woman in this photo responded to questions presented in the cube, seeking their hopes for the region's future. The responses were then recorded and utilized to develop a region-wide statistically valid survey that prioritized and ultimately resulted in new goals, policies, and actions for the region. The plan includes interactive GIS maps with never before available data open to the public 24 hours a day. What a great idea. Um, what, a, what an innovative way to be able to survey uh, your population. It's sometimes hard to get people to uh, do that online because they get so many things to read and do anymore. But this is a fun event and a fun way of gathering information. So um, congratulations, Lahai Valley Planning Commission. Up next we have a submission from the Alamo Area Council of Governments in San Antonio, Texas. ACOC ad administers a senior demonstration program that pairs seniors over the age of 55 with local veterans to build camaraderie and companionship in hopes of avoiding isolation. This helps with both groups 
but this helps both groups remain in their homes, independent for as long as possible. Seniors remain actively engaged while veterans socialize and assist their companion with basic household chores and accompanying them to errands such as doctor's visits. Um, the veteran pictured here turned 93 years old in May and his companion organized a social distancing celebration and it looks like they are appropriately distant. This is a great program, I love it. Um, as we all know, one of the biggest public health problems right now has to do with isolation and depression. And so what a great program that they developed. Again, kudos to the Alamo Area Council of Governments. Congratulations. Next, we have Next, we have the Centralina Council of Governments located in Charlotte, North Carolina. The, uh, they organized a public demonstration project. That's beautiful, isn't it? Um, to improve pedestrian connections and safety in the Wilmore neighborhood of Charlotte. This paint by number project brought together over 100 volunteers and coincided with Open Street 704, which is an event that temporarily closes public streets to encourage pedestrian and bicycle traffic while creating a healthier, more connected community. Centralina uh, regional planning staff served on the steering committee for the placemaking project which was funded by the Cultivating Healthy Commu uh, Communities Grant from the Aetna Foundation and coordinated with surrounding property owners, artists, volunteers, and the city of Charlotte. What a wonderful project. Another great project that was submitted and obviously an award winner. Thank you so much. And again, um, congratulations to the Central, uh, Central Line Council of Governments. Next slide, we have a photo submission winner which comes from the Southeastern Metropolitan Council of Governments in Detroit, Michigan. We should have been there. We could have actually been on the bank uh, and experienced this. SEMCOG launched Southeast Michigan Trail Explorer it's an interactive tool that enables users to virtually travel hundreds of miles of land and water trails throughout the region. So a very appropriate photo contest winner at this time in 2020 where most of us have to just travel virtually. Uh, the Google Street View style tool, which is also integrated with the Southeast Michigan Park Finder, uh, app provides opportunities for local officials to plan for improvements and enables residents and visitors to plan recreation experiences. In this photo, two visual data gatherers are boating one of Southeast Michigan's water trails to collect images that are now a part of the Trail Explorer experience. Another great project, and now you could virtually travel and then plan when you can to be able to actually go and experience it in person. So congratulations to SEMCOG. We look forward, I hope, in two years to be able to uh, visit uh, the Detroit area. Next slide. Up next, we have a submission from the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency in Wellington, Florida. Complete streets take on a new meaning, as you can see, in Wellington during the winter months as equestrians worldwide participate in a championship show jumping contest and polo matches. In this photo, groomsmen lead two horses across an equestrian actuated mid-block crosswalk. How interesting. With push buttons positioned for both pedestrians and riders, while motorists yield the right away. Okay, I want to know, can the horses hoof to the, you know, push button? Maybe. <laughs> I need some applause or laughs in the background. This must be a hard job when you're 
you know, actually doing a television program, you know? But anyway, another wonderful, what a great idea. Um, and again, I want to congratulate Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency in Wellington, uh, Florida. Next slide, our next last photo contest winner comes from the Miami-Dade uh, Transportation Planning Organization in Miami. This TPO received $100 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation for the South Corridor uh, of the Strategic Miami Area of Rapids Transit, or SMART plan. On August 30th, 2018, the TPO Governing Bo uh, Board approved bus rapid transit for this um, a 20 mile exclusive transit way between the Dadeland South Metro Rail Station and Florida City. That is very cool, isn't it? Very, very cool. And I wonder how they got a hundred million dollars. I'm gonna have to give them a call. I could use some of that. They they worked hard to get that, as we all know uh, how difficult it can sometimes be um, to get such sums of money, but that well deserved. This is very, very cool. On behalf of, uh, of everyone at NARC, I want to thank everyone who submitted photos. Y'all are doing a great job out there. They were all these photos are a great addition to the conference and told amazing stories about the work that our members continue to do during the, this trying time. But again, it's about opportunities and quite obviously everyone came through. And now please take a moment to watch this video, which is provided by the Atlanta Regional Commission as we gear up for next year's 55th annual conference and exhibition in Atlanta, Georgia. Take it away. all going to be ready after all the virtual conferences. Hopefully in October, um, uh, we will be able to meet uh, for the executive uh, conference and then of course for the executive board meeting. But um, definitely the whole membership, it, it looks like Atlanta is gonna be a great place to go. So hopefully you're all planning on it and we're gonna look forward to seeing you all next year in Atlanta. I'll now go ahead. It looks like um, I'm going to hand this off to Chris Barnett, who will be moderating our update from Local Government Partners session. Um, Les, I'll take a minute. I don't know if Chris is on yet, but I do want to take a moment to thank Leslie and Percy, who have done a wonderful job putting this conference together. And, it just, again, shows you when we're presented a challenge, we all can come through. We've got a great staff and a great membership. And I want to make sure I thank staff. Leslie, you and your staff have done an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marge. Thank you for helping us pull it all together. I think we'll take a brief intermission until we are um, ready for our next session. We really look forward to uh, hearing from our partners, um, our NARC partners, local government partners, National Association of Counties, and National League of Cities, 
uh, to give us an update on their legislative efforts and um, and to hear our, their call to action to help all of us get involved in in promoting more funding for lo for local programs to replace and to help backfill some of the impacts on lo local budgets. So we will be with them in a couple of minutes. We will see uh, all of our slides again. We thank you, Marge, so much for pulling this all together and keeping us moving. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you all so right. much. Very good. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Good morning. If you're just Hi, joining, Leslie. hello. Happy. Um, so I just talked to Clarence. Um, our start time is 11:30, right? Correct. So we're online. Let's take this offline because we have people watching. <laughs> okay. Good morning. If you're just joining us, we're getting set up for our next session. Take a brief information uh, intermission, get some coffee, and get ready for some great sessions.
If you're just joining us, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back shortly in a couple of minutes to get started. Good morning. Why don't we get started? I know our panelists are ready, so make yourself visible. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello, Chris Barnett and Clarence. Hello, Clarence. Hello, welcome to all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I know Matt and Clarence, your lives have gotten way more complicated in the last couple of weeks. And I we appreciate your agreeing to uh, to join us this morning. Um, I know you both are going to moving to virtual meetings as well. So we wish you luck. We're on day two. Um, and we thank you. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator and our want to be host if we were able to be in Detroit, but since we're not and we're here, Chris is our representative. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. I think I'm unmuted. I know the organizer had me muted, which I think was on purpose. As if you know me, they, they love to mute me, but um, I'm supposed to be welcoming you to our amazing city, Detroit, right now, but instead this will have to do virtually. So uh, I just want to say thank you to NARC uh, for putting this together. I think it's wonderful. I think now more than ever, it's important for us as local leaders uh, and regional leaders to collaborate and put our heads together. And so, so thank you, Nark, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we'll let you know that if we do want your input and your feedback during this session, so um, please use the uh, chat function. Uh, we will see those questions pop up and we will make sure we're able to ask those. Um, I am so excited because this is an amazing session and I hope you have your notepad ready because you're gonna hear from some uh, subject matter experts. So um, today we're joined by the National Association of Counties Director Matt Chase and the National League of Cities Director Clarence Anthony. Uh, these organizations, if you didn't know, uh, they represent local leaders from across the nation and established NARC over 50 years ago, recognizing the value for local leaders working together across jurisdictional uh, issues. Our partnership continues as we have always appreciated the opportunity to hear from them now and how we might uh, be able to support our joint priorities. And believe me, we have so many joint priorities right now. Um, uh, as a personal aside, my brother, uh, Brian Barnett, is the mayor of the neighboring town here, Rochester Hills, Michigan. He's also the current president of the United States Conference of Mayors. Uh, and so I've had the opportunity to work alongside him uh, and, and he's worked uh, closely with these two gentlemen as well and these organizations. So uh, we're grateful for their leadership. Today, as I mentioned, it's so important 
uh, as we reel from the impact of coronavirus, the economic devastation that we're currently facing and we're sure to face, and then on top of that, the racial divisions that have been exposed by the murder of George Floyd uh, that have really captivated all of our communities. Uh, the devastation to our local economies is widespread. I don't need to tell any of you that you're experiencing that. Uh, we know the CARES Act has provided us a measure of support, but many of our communities uh, still have not been able to receive that funding. So today with, with NACO and NLC, uh, we're joined in supporting more essential legislation that will backfill our local communities and fund essential workers, teachers, nurses, our firefighters, first responders, certainly law enforcement. We're really anxious to hear from our guests. Um, and most of you probably know Mr. Chase, and Mr. Anthony, uh, we will take questions. Uh, but for now, I'm going to introduce these distinguished gentlemen. Clarence Anthony is the CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities, the largest and oldest organization representing America's cities and their leaders. Under his leadership, NLC has advanced policies that expand local control and provide direct funding for local programs related to public safety, infrastructure, transportation, and sustainability. Mr. Anthony began his career in public service as the mayor of South Bay, Florida for 24 years. So he's one of us, he knows. Uh, he's, uh, he's known as a creative and thoughtful leader in his community, and he's considered an expert in citizen engagement and techniques that build sense of communities within cities. Mr. Anthony has been on the forefront of politi politics in the United States and internationally for the past 20 years, culminating with productive presidencies of the Florida League of Cities and the National League of Cities, respectively. Following after we hear from Mr. Anthony, uh, Mr. Matthew Chase has served as the CEO and Executive Director of the National Association of Counties since September 2012. As Chief Executive Officer, he's responsible for the overall management of the association. NACO is the only national association representing America's 3,069 county governments. During his professional career, Matt has focused on promoting America's economic competitiveness, strengthening the intergovernmental system of federal, state, and local officials, and engaging local elected officials in the federal policy making process. In addition, he's a regular presenter on the impact of the federal budget and policy trends on local government and communities. Previously, Matt served nearly a decade as the executive director of the National Association of Development Organizations, or NATO, uh, not that NATO, uh, representing local government based regionally planning and development organizations. Prior to becoming NATO's executive director, he was the organization's deputy executive director and public affairs director. So first, actually I lied, I'm gonna to go to Matt first. I'm gonna to go to Matt first, that's my agenda here. So first I'm gonna to go to you, Matt, thank you for joining us. And then we'll turn to Clarence. So Matt, please, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, would love to hear some remarks from you. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you to the members of the National Association of Regional Councils. Leslie is doing a great job, we're, we're pleased to partner with Leslie and her team at the staff level. We're, we're co-located actually with the National League of Cities, NARC and NACO are, are all sharing space. And so it, it's great to show that partnership. And I am going first because I, I joined NACO about a month before Clarence joined NLC. So I am the senior member of this, of this dynamic duo. So, you know, I, I, that is the one privilege I have, although Clarence always gets the last word. So, there are challenges. It is really important right now that cities and counties come together and work regionally. And it's always a good idea, but now the importance of regional councils really comes through as we re really need to rethink our communities and our regions. We also need the expertise of the regional councils as they help us navigate this web of federal resources how do you access it? How do you manage the money? And ultimately, how are we accountable to the taxpayers and the public for how we use these funds? As the supervisor said, 80% of the country thinks the US is out of control. It is one thing that, that it appears the American public agrees on, that we have the COVID-19 public health crisis. I think we've lost kind of an understanding of the scope of this pandemic that we've had over 100,000 official deaths. It's probably higher than that. And to think that in only two or three months, those 100,000 deaths are already in the top 10 causes of fatalities. It surpassed suicides, kidney failure. It, it's more than double of lost life from the flu. 
It's more lost lives than diabetes. And just to give you a scale, I mean, it's now a top six cause of death in the United States. Combine that with the economic fallout of 42.5 million Americans collecting unemployment. Those are just astounding numbers. In the, in the Great Recession of 2008 through 2010, it took us two or three years to reach 16 million unemployed. And so we obviously passed that early on in just a few weeks, and we're now sitting at about a 42 million. And then you add in the racial injustice, police brutality, and the rightful protest, and it's really exacerbated, again, by the economic conditions where of those 42 million Americans who are unemployed, the disproportionate number are brown and black and also young. And so we really have our hands full, combined with the fact that it's an election year. And so emotions are, are really high already. From a county perspective, we, I look forward to jumping into the conversation about the, our legislative strategy. Congress has passed four bills, or as we like to say, three and a half, with the last one being the 3.5 assistance package. We are working together as state and local governments right now on the next package. The House HEROES Act obviously provided a substantial investment for state and local governments. The Senate is starting to move our way. We're having really productive conversations with Senate Republican leadership and rank and file members. They're seeing the needs and they also have learned from past recessions that if we get the private sector back up and running and yet state and local are still laying off people and cutting investments, that the economy will never reach its full potential. So what we have really focused on is telling the county story that like cities, we truly are on the front lines, particularly with the public health pandemic. Counties own 1,000 hospitals and 800 nursing homes and run over 1,900 public health departments. But we also have huge responsibilities in the human services and around infrastructure, economic development, and making sure we're building really strong, sustainable economies. So what I wanted to do is just say our message to Congress is we are looking for direct federal aid in this next package. We need it to cover not only expenditures, but also lost revenue particularly in those states where local governments have sales tax, some have income tax, but also things like our gas tax and other user fees have really suffered, that we're losing time in our, our challenge to rebuild our infrastructure and make our communities better. And we're also very willing to be accountable. There's a lot of discussion around accountability and we embrace that. And so we welcome what we call as guardrails, not third rails of politics, but guardrails. How can we really be effective in making sure we're investing federal money and taxpayer money in an efficient way? I'll just end with the scale of the problem is huge. Uh, county governments nationally, our combined budgets are, are a little over $600 billion a year. Counties employ 3.6 million Americans. More than 1% of all Americans actually work for county government. And our forecasts are that over the next 18 months, we could be looking at both increased cost and declining revenues of about 144 billion. And that's not including potential cuts from state government down to the local level or any declines in our property tax revenues. That's simply looking at sales tax and other types of non-property tax revenue at the county level. It's a huge, huge scale. And we want to be good partners with the federal government in figuring out a path forward. So I look forward to the conversation and really appreciate the partnership with NARC as well as the National League of Cities. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for all that wonderful news. <laughs> uh, but the truth is important. Who would have ever thought uh, we would be facing these times? Um, so that was really good. We're going we're gonna to hold all the questions uh, till, till after Clarence speaks. So again, please use the chat function. Uh, to type any questions you might have uh, for Clarence or Matt. Uh, and, and now, uh, with no further ado, I will turn uh, to Mr. Clarence Anthony. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, Supervisor. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to address uh, NARC and, NARC and uh, also our partnership. Uh, uh, clearly, Leslie is an alumni of the National League of Cities as a former legislative person. And we are now working um, with her hand in hand 
uh, as, as she is leading uh, the National Association of Regional Councils. Um, I'll first say that, uh, Chris, I'll tell your brother that you're the better looking leader uh, and the smartest of uh, the Barnett family, um, because I know Brian very well. I pray, my mom, just so you know, my mom says the same thing, so that's totally fine. Yeah, so that'll be another fight I start with him when I see him. Right. The other thing I'll say is during this time, I, I could not ask for any better partner than uh, Matt Chase at NACO. Um, when you work on issues together, as we have over the last eight years, uh, you really develop an opportunity to go to war, if you will, uh, with somebody who really is committed uh, to making sure that local governments are represented and their voice are heard. So uh, Matt's, Matt's my partner. And as I, I think about um, the opportunity to talk to you all, um, I think about the fact that we are in an amazing, uh, unfortunate time in our nation, one that I never imagined uh, being uh, in, a time where we have a virus that is uh, destroying um, people and families and the lives of people in our nation, but also uh, devastating our um, cities and towns and villages and counties and all local governments and state, our nation. And when this kind of, kind of epidemic occurred, which we never anticipated, this virus, um, we had to respond. NACO, National League of Cities, U.S. Conference Mayors, all of us, the governors, had to come together. And I'll tell you that uh, Matt has been an amazing leader in helping us to stay focused and get the data and information that we need. I will also share with you that um, this is my first uh, opportunity to speak to any national group since uh, the murder of George Floyd. And I, I think too, it's, it, it's causing me to, to be cautious of what I say, but be honest with you guys as municipal leaders, because this is a time that we need some honest dialogue. We need honest leadership uh, and we need each other. And so let me first talk about um, the first challenge that we are addressing. Uh, and that is uh, the funding that we need for local governments. Um, National League of uh, Cities has created and launched a campaign called uh, Cities Are Essential, uh, where we're working with um, NACO and others to try to get direct funding to protect families and municipal workers and really the economy of America. We need that money from the federal government. And we wanna make sure that the grant dollars that are awarded to cities, towns and villages, uh, how they are given to us through this pandemic, uh, have um, some um, uh, barriers around how, how we will use it in this response time. And there's no question that people are with these narratives that uh, we're bailing our cities, towns and villages and local governments. That is not what we're asking for. We're asking to get dollars to make sure that we uh, cover this loss in revenue uh, and expe unexpected expenditures that we had to make because local governments, counties, cities and villages in America are the ones that are at the, in the front line of dealing with this issue. And uh, we wanna make sure we get direct funding uh, to those cities. You know, there's no question that the first funding provided uh, dollars to counties and cities that were uh, over 500,000. What we're working on right now is to get direct funding to uh, cities that are under 500,000 uh, and local governments. Uh, Matt has already talked about um, you know, the past funding, uh, the CARES Act and what it provided. Uh, and we can go with go into that a little bit more. We're now looking at the HEROES Act that has been proposed. And we know that the Senate is not uh, fav 
favoring that uh, legislation. We're also looking at the SMART Act uh, and how $79 billion can be uh, allocated to uh, local governments. So our response is being able to get our members to be able to work uh, hand in hand with our partners, with NACO and NARC and uh, the other big seven organizations, um, because this is essential. This time is essential that we get funding uh, to uh, uh, local governments around uh, the issue and response to uh, this virus that we were not prepared for. Um, the, the second issue is that along with uh, the virus, uh, we've seen a protest in America from over 200 uh, cities, all 50 states uh, related to uh, race in America. And again, on the front lines uh, are those mayors and council members and county chairs that are standing up and trying to lead their cities uh, during this time. What it causes us to do is to look at ourselves as regional leaders, because, you know, just because, you know, it happened in Minneapolis, um, we thought that, ah, this is just a Minneapolis issue. But what is shown is that it's a nationwide issue and a call for us to respond and deal with the issue of race, race you know, disparity and the challenges that we have. And our leaders are struggling as well. Um, you know, it's personal. Uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms' uh, daughter uh, received a text or, of a racial epithet telling her to shut up and reopen uh, Atlanta because, in fact, she was trying to respond uh, to what was needed for her community, combining both the issue of the virus and the issue of race. So we're hopeful that we recognize that this is not just an issue that is for today. It is an issue that we need to, as uh, leaders in our nation, uh, step up and uh, respond to. The National League of Cities has some resources that I can talk about a little bit later, but I just wanted to put a pin in uh, the one-two punch that America is de dealing with, and that is this virus. And in fact, we are also dealing uh, with the racial disparities. And what a time for, for real leadership on a regional level, but also we must uh, step up as, as regional and local leaders. So with that, uh, Chris, Supervisor, I'll return it back over to you and Matt so we can get into some additional uh, discussion. Well, thank you, Clarence, for those remarks. I think that was, um, I think it was spot on. I think that we, um, I don't know if many of us who are local leaders knew what we were signing up for. I don't think you could ever um, forecast a global pandemic, um, all of the racial um, disparity that we're seeing across the country. And I can tell you, you know, um, and again, I wanna encourage you all right now to please take a moment to type in a question in your chat um, chat function so we can ask these two experts questions and uh, we want to value their time as well. So if you could do that, but I would just say that, you know, I'm an, I'm a, I, I am the supervisor of a small community of about 40,000 people, 30 miles north of Detroit. And um, we are right in the middle of it as well. And I think that it is, the time now is, is more evident than ever, the fact that we need to, to step up and lead as organizations. Uh, because there are folks like me that don't know what the heck we're doing. And we need to have those partnerships at the local level with our um, councils of governments and our planning organizations, but then also at the uh, federal level with, with folks like you and the great work your, your organizations do. I wonder, Clarence, if I can start with you and just, um, I know a little bit about cities are essential. My brother's been pushing that big time here in Metro Detroit, but will you um, dive a little deeper into that? How can, how can we on this um, webinar support uh, your efforts what can we do to support that? And tell us a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Um, cities are essential. Um, the whole messaging here is that 
uh, we are providing uh, the essential services uh, and we're on the front lines as we're dealing with the virus. And we are the ones with our local governments that are providing the tests, uh, the EMT, the police, the public service, the fires uh, response, firefighter response. And if we don't get money uh, to help defray those expenses, our cities won't recover. There will be a loss of jobs uh, from our cities and counties. And therefore, we won't be able to uh, recover. And if local governments don't recover, our nation won't recover. So we're asking our mayors, council members, county commissioners, our local partners uh, to um, speak up write op-eds, um, step up and speak before your chambers and ask them uh, to write letters, uh, to pass resolutions, um, to be more vocal with your senators about why it is important to get direct funding uh, to cities. Um, very frankly, um, we know that uh, we need uh, Republican leaders uh, to step up at this time. And I also will tell you the small and rural communities need help and will need more help as we continue through 2021, 2022, because the cycle of when we see the loss may not be today. It may be in fact, uh, during our next budget process. So uh, loud and clear, we're just saying cities are essential and we need uh, local leaders to step up and to share uh, their stories and put the face on, on, on this issue. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think um, that's really important. If there's ever a time for us to come together, it's now. Republicans and Democrats, um, you know, we provide the essential services. And by the way, if you just Google um, cities are essential or you go to NLC's website, you can see that there's a kind of a call to action. You can um, there's some links you can click. I'd encourage everyone on this call to take 10 minutes a day and, uh, and surf over there to NLC site. Cities are essential. You can just Google it. That's all I did, and it pops right up. Uh, and there's a couple uh, areas where they're asking for action. Uh, so please let's support Clarence and his organization there. Um, I, Matt, I'll throw it to you. I think that we've seen, uh, at least in Michigan, I'll speak specific to what I know, uh, which isn't a lot, uh, but in Michigan with the CARES Act, we we saw five counties, I'm sorry, five communities receive direct funding. Uh, that would be our four lar largest counties, Oakland, Macomb, and Wayne, which make up Southeast Michigan, and then Kent County, which is the west side of the state, Grand Rapids, and then the city of Detroit. Uh, the rest of us were left out. And so, um, and we know Heroes doesn't look like it's gonna go, it doesn't look like the Senate's going to uh, to see that through. So Matt, what, what what's your advice and, and what are you guys doing specifically to help get more funding to the rest of the counties in the country that, that didn't make that 500,000 uh, resident threshold? And what, what would you encourage the, the folks on this meeting to do? Yeah, and before I dive into that, you know, your earlier point about leadership in these times is, the question always is, do leaders define the times or do the times define the leaders? And I think there's probably truth in both those statements. And one of the things with this COVID-19 pandemic is I've had a lot of time to read and watch the History Channel. And when you listen to the stories of George Washington that the History Channel did, or most recently the Grant miniseries, you really do see that leaders need to step up. And that's what our communities need. On the CARES Act, I think it's really important for cities and county leaders and town leaders to understand that 24 hours before the CARES Act passed, local governments weren't getting anything. That original $150 billion that was assigned to the US Treasury through the Coronavirus Relief Fund was really intended for the states. And it wasn't until groups like NLC, the US Conference of Mayors and NACO stepped in and really demanded that Congress provide money for local governments. What they ended up doing was creating kind of a clumsy mechanism for those 500,000 and above to receive direct funding, it is limited in, the, in both its scope, but also that you can't use it for lost revenue, which is really a, a major problem for most local governments. 
moving forward, we're doing the same as NLC. We have a We Are Counties campaign. And I think it's really what we're both trying to do, and I think Clarence articulated it, is we want to humanize local government that we are not a bunch of bureaucrats sitting around pushing paper. These are frontline workers who are out there directly working with the community. And both of our organizations have spent a lot of time educating federal policymakers about the very different, distinct roles and responsibilities that cities and counties have, that we aren't providing the same exact services. There are cases where we do, but we have really specific charters. In our case, we, we both work on infrastructure, we both work on human services, but we have different pieces of that. One might be homelessness, one might be behavioral health. And what we're trying to really do, and I think NARC is so essential in this, is remind folks that our system is layered and that what we don't want is Congress to pit cities versus counties versus towns that all local governments need assistance, that we are all essential. But what we are doing is we're actually using the CARES Act as a great example to show that in county, in the cases of counties, we're not keeping all that treasury money in the county coffers. Most counties are actually sub-allocating and making awards to small businesses. We are really concerned about the nonprofit community particularly those dealing with domestic violence and substance abuse and homelessness and other things that are only being exacerbated with 42 million unemployed Americans. And yes, we are investing in our own technology and our own workforce and our own services, but a dollar spent by the federal government into a city or a county ensures that it goes into the local community. And I'm not taking shots at our state counterparts, but when you fund state governments, 80% of the money will stay in the state capital. And so by helping cities and counties, you're actually helping local economies. And so we're, we're just gonna keep beating the drum. And I can't stress enough that we need this process to be bipartisan. And I know we've been criticized as, oh, you're just working with Democrats, no. We are working with any and all members of Congress or the administration who are aligned with what we are trying to do. We will work with any and all, and we are. I think Clarence brought up the SMART Act, and one of the reasons that we're supporting it is not just the funding, but it's the fact that six Republican and Democratic senators came together in a bipartisan manner to recognize and put a plant a flag that state and local governments matter. One of the things about the CARES Act is there's this kind of campaign to say, oh, look at all the money that state and local governments already have. The reality is most of that money is not going to cities and counties and states as institutions. It's going to state, cities, and counties as geographies. And there's a big difference. And so we want our small businesses to thrive. We want our big businesses to thrive. That's the best thing, that's in our best interest. So again, I, we're optimistic that the Senate is gonna come together. I think what we're waiting for is probably the unemployment insurance money to run out, for the PPP small business money to run out. And I think that will be the real political pressure and we're gonna have to jump on that, that train. And we understand that the HEROES Act is probably too much money. We understand that, but we needed a starting point and we, that's how the legislative process works, right? You need the House and Senate to come together and you need the president to sign it. And so we're just working our way through the process. That's really, really great information there, Matt. Um, so, so let me get this right. There, uh, there's never been a higher demand for services of our local governments and our counties and our cities. Uh, we're all facing a huge revenue shortfall and we're just expected to, to figure this out. So the one interesting thing that I would say is I've talked to um, one of my senators and uh, two of my, con I have one congressman, but uh, I talked to two that represent our area. And I think the biggest thing from my, my take um, and, and, and my feedback from, from speaking with them is they don't really still totally understand how some of these folks came from local government. Some of them don't have really any idea how cities and counties and townships are funded, how they work. Um, 
you know, what a 10% revenue reduction means to us, what it means to our police and fire services. And so I think the biggest thing that I've been able to do that's, that's been able to move the needle maybe a little bit is just the, the, the personal reach outs, the, the education. Hey, come sit in my office and look at my budget with me and let me show you where we're, we're taking it in the teeth. And, um, you know, obviously you have to have that relationship with your elected officials to be able to do that. And so that's something that we should all take from this experience yeah. and how important it is to have those relationships in advance. Um, and I know at least over here at SEMCOG, um, we have great relationships with our electeds. Um, but that's can something I, can really I, can important. Can I, can I, can I go in and I want to pass it to Clarence? And sorry, sorry to, to no, go ahead. flow, but both NLC and NACO have been working with, with outside groups. For example, the National Association of Home Builders, I think, called both of our organizations and said, what advocacy efforts can we sign on to? Because we know as home builders, if city and county budgets are cut, or in your case, town budgets are cut, you need to raise that money because of your mandates. And so what are you going to do? You're going to raise fees on home builders. You're going to increase your land use permit fees, your building inspection fees. And we would much rather work with you to rebuild the economy and also work with Congress because all you're going to do is pass the funding on to us because we know those roles and responsibilities don't go away. And Clarence, I think, did an exceptional job of getting other groups, local chambers of commerce through the American Chamber of Commerce Executives Group. We're talking to them on a weekly basis because those frontline Main Street businesses understand homelessness is a problem. They understand mental health is a problem. They understand that the unemployment rates of our youth is a massive generational problem. And so what we're excited about is it's just not cities and counties voicing the need for us. It's actually our nonprofit partners and chambers and others in the private sector saying, we need a healthy, vibrant local government. Right. Very, very good stuff. I'm going to throw it to an uh, well, interesting stat on that. I, I just heard on the radio that in the last four weeks, we've seen one year's worth of suicides. And that was on the local uh, WWJ, which is a local Detroit news radio. So uh, I didn't get the exact source, so I can't cite the source. But we know that mental health, because of the um, many of us have been on, on lockdowns or stay home orders, uh, our calls for service for family trouble, domestic violence are skyrocketing. Uh, because people are just cooped up. And so any thought of cutting funding for our police services uh, or first responders is is unfathomable to us right now. So I'm going to throw it to Macy for a moment. Unless, Clarence, did you want to jump in? I know, Matt, you were kind of tossing something to him there. Did you want to add anything before I jump to Macy here with any questions we might have? Yeah, um, I mean, the only thing I, I'd add is, um, again, I think Matt talked about putting a face uh, to this issue. Um, and the fact that clearly um, this is not a partisan issue. Uh, and when you go and you are on the streets in cities, towns, and villages, and counties, and you see how hard our employees are working, we're not asking for a bailout at all. That is far from what we are asking for. We're just asking uh, to, uh, to help get back, if we ever will, uh, the dollars that we've expended on the response. The response is not a state response. It's not a federal response. You don't, you go into counties and you can see in, uh, I'm from Palm Beach County, uh, and you can see our, our county administrator, our county mayor, and uh, the, the public service response. Uh, you can also, you talk about mental health, you can also see um, the stress that it's having on our local leaders. You can look at their faces and you can see the stress in their face. You talk about mental health. You know, I've started talking about that we as municipal regional leaders um, need to put our mask on first as they ask us to do on an airplane. We need to put our mask on first so that we can lead through this time. Um, again, I'll talk about Mayor Bottoms. She has been attacked because she was trying to um, manage the opening of her city. Uh, we had a county administrator uh, in Oklahoma that was uh, called Hitler uh, because he was saying 
I'm not ready to, to do this. Um, you know, a lot of times we are leading and we're not thinking about how we put our mask on ourselves and deal with our mental health uh, as we deal with this pandemic and we deal with um, the racial unrest in our nation. Um, so I'm glad we're transferring a little bit to the mental health part, uh, but my message is we need to think about ourselves as well. Absolutely. Well, well said. Um, I'm going to throw it to Macy. Uh, Macy, do we have any questions uh, that have come through? Yes, thanks, Chris. Uh, just a couple questions here. Um, first one is, thank you, NACO and NLC, for the great partnership with NARC. As our nation looks towards economic recovery, what are the prospects for additional federal investment in infrastructure? And what are the prospects for a timely reauthorization of the FAST Act? What is your definition of timely? <laughs> uh, you know, one of the challenges that we have as a nation, and when you look at your personal life, you try and save during the best of times so that when you do hit a bump in the road, you have savings. And as at the federal level, we spent the last couple of years spending during the best of times. And so now you reach a pandemic and the federal government is truly broke. You know, we're $22 trillion in debt and, and skyrocketing. When it comes to infrastructure, it's gonna be a challenge that as we spend money on the general pandemic response and the economic fallout, when it comes to the highway trust fund, back in 2008, Congress broke the longstanding tradition of having the highway trust fund pay for itself and we move to a hybrid of using user fees, mainly gas taxes, with general funds. And since 2008, the federal government has put $140 billion in general funds into the surface transportation bill. So for transit, highways, bridges, and safety. Uh, the House Democrats just came out with their new plan. The Senate had already moved forward on their plan. They are definitely different visions, but the bills that have come forward we're optimistic about. There's a lot to like about them, but the big question remains, how are we gonna fund them? And how are we going to build the political courage to either use more debt financing, which means general funds, or look at the gas tax or vehicle miles traveled. We've studied these issues to death. And it comes back to what are our values? Um, we've been working with the House Ways and Means Committee throughout the pandemic on broader infrastructure finance. So we lost the ability to refinance municipal bonds. There's a lot of discussion about the difference between financing and funding. They are very different. Financing is the ability to occur, incur more debt and pay it back versus funding, we equate more to like dollar for dollar grants, things like the Highway Trust Fund. So the bottom line is, I think we have to keep pushing that great nations don't let their infrastructure decline. And so what are our values as a country? And are we gonna continue to invest in a world-class infrastructure for a world-class economy? And I think we also learned, we already knew this, but broadband <clears throat> has to be front and center with our roads and bridges. And we gotta figure out how are we gonna fund aviation and transit when the revenues are gonna dry up for a while. So a lot of media issues and you know, NARC is front and center on these conversations. And we look forward to just keep educating our members of Congress that you, you can only defer maintenance on infrastructure for so long and it eventually costs you more to replace it than to invest up front. Yeah, I, I I just say that I, I agree with Matt 100%. Um, it is my hope, um, because we've all been working on this uh, infrastructure bill um, for probably at least a decade, right? And so I'm hopeful that we will get through um, trying to get a bill passed on uh, for funding for uh, local governments and our nation and small businesses. 
and then let's go straight to work on an infrastructure bill uh, because um, it's going to take all of the stimulus, if you will, we can get uh, to uh, get people back to work and um, to get our uh, economy uh, started. And if what we're going through um, right now does not show the need for just fixing our infrastructure, uh, first of all, but the job creation opportunities at the same time, this is the time to get an infrastructure bill done and to get it done in a way that um, uh, improves our infrastructure while creating jobs. Wonderful. Macy, do you have any other questions? I got another one here if, if you don't have any, but go ahead if you have one, Macy. You know, I think Leslie's actually going to jump in here. To... Oh, hi, Leslie. Hey, I just want to say, Chris, if you have one last question, then we promised to let uh, Matt and Clarence go early. Um, they have so much going on. We appreciate them taking this time. I know um, when they agreed to speak, they did not have virtual conferences and they did not have all the racial unrest going on. So um, we we begged to keep them here. So just one more question and then we'll let them go. You know, you know uh, it's a softball. It's easy. It's um, so if you know, we, we all have these conferences. We always take all this information. But if there's one thing you want us to do, you have a captive audience and how can we support you best in your efforts? What's the one thing from each of you? If you could get everyone on this webinar to do one one action, what would it be? to support your efforts most? For me, I'm gonna talk about more of the regional councils that I think values matter. And having regional councils facilitate regional conversations about your values. That are we truly going to be a great inclusive nation or are we gonna be a divided nation? We are not guaranteed to stay as a United States of America. We have seen that throughout our history and having civil, honest conversations about inclusive economies where infrastructure and planning is so important. Where you put a sewer line or, or wastewater, where you put a road, where you put a, a transit stop, that matters. And what are the values and I think regional councils, it's so important, as we say here at NACO, plan the work, work the plan. And if we don't have visions for our regions, where are we going? We're just kind of scattered. And I think it's so important because nobody wants to fund planning. Uh, you know, I, I spent all those years at NATO and I worked with NARC. Planning is the hardest thing to get funding for. And getting people back to values, I think is so important. Awesome. Thank you. Clarence, what, what's your one, what's your one thing to get the last word here? I think we got you muted. I, I, I think Matt is, is. Sorry, Clarence, motivated. I didn't mean to mute you. <laughs> Matt has motivated me uh, with his closing comment and, um, I'll just say that um, we never imagine a time like this. And, you know, as local leaders, here's what we signed up for. It's our moment. It's our moment to step up and lead our communities, our towns, villages, as well as our counties in America. And if we don't, um, we're going to find ourselves uh, not recovering, not rebuilding. Uh, and not eventually getting to a stimulus in, in our communities. You know, Supervisor, I look at, you know, what you're doing in, in your township talking about uh, Orion Strong. I mean, you know, you're saying that um, we're going to find ways to get our cities uh, to get involved, our citizens to get involved, how to give grants to small businesses, how to give loans to small businesses. If you don't do that and take this moment, your township will not return. So ultimately what we need from our regional leaders is to lead, is to lead on recovery, lead on rebuilding, lead on stimulus, stand up and own your position. You were elected, go into the Senator's office and say, damn it, do your job, lead. 
don't go wimping as if they are better than you. They are not. They were elected by you, just like you, and you have that responsibility to do it. So let's lead on racial tension. Let's lead on recovery, economic development. Let's lead and make sure that everybody that's in your township, your county, and your state and region feels like they have been represented by a strong leader. So it's our moment. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us. We know you're extremely busy. We are so grateful for the knowledge you've imparted to us. Hopefully, uh, everybody was, I was ready to clap. I didn't want to interrupt you, but both of you had great close closings, and uh, we know you're busy. We, we want to respect your time. So thank you so much. And Chris, I'll tell Brian that you're a lot better looking and smarter. I appreciate that. He already <laughs> texted me three times. As he, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, he's a pain. Uh, the one okay. thing, I, I'll let, th let them go. But Leslie, can I just share one thing with the group still, if, if they want to listen to this? The one thing that, that, that both Matt and Clarence touched on that, that has been evident here in, in Oakland County and in Southeast Michigan is local leaders need the support of other local leaders now more than ever. We have to become our own sounding boards. No, no one else understands what we're going through. And, I, and Matt and Clarence both touched on that in different ways in their, in their comments. But um, I'll tell you, not, not, that, not that we've done anything special, but I've started a standing Monday 1130 uh, Zoom meeting with local electeds, uh, originally just from our county. There's 62 municipalities in Oakland County. Uh, it's expanded a little bit to Macomb. And um, every single week, it's the chief elected official, the mayor or the supervisor. And we have 20 people at least every week on the call, looking at each other's faces, sharing ideas, asking for support. We have a rally this weekend. What do you do? How do we support our black community? The sharing of ideas is more important now than ever. And then just the emotional support that hey i got your back we, we got you we, we'll help you out this this works for us so i would encourage every mpo every cog that's on this call to really think about opening up a channel uh for local electeds and maybe the chief local electeds that are in the you know in the, in the hot seat the most uh to have a place where they can feel safe they can vent it's not a public meeting it's not oma it's not public you know we're not facebook living and it's just a a safe place uh to share and, and respond, and, and it's been extremely uh, helpful here in our community, in our county, and, and people have loved it. So just an idea I threw out there to you all as well, and I'm sorry for, for blabbing around there a bit, so. Awesome, thank you for your public service. Hey, thank you guys, thanks Matt. Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, sorry not to see you in person. Right, thank you. Thank you guys. And thank you Chris for a great discussion. Uh, it's easy when you have awesome, uh, net dynamic national leaders. But thank you for the opportunity. And again, wish you all were here in Detroit, but uh, we'll, we'll rain check that. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody. I think you're muted, Leslie. I think you might be muted. I am. Thank you. All right, stay tuned. We'll have a, a brief, uh, inter another intermission as we get our next panelists uh, together.
Leslie? Hey, Carrie. Hey, Mike. I've got my microphone on and my um, my camera off. What are we? Is that where we're supposed to be at this moment? I think so. Like I just turned mine on so you could see. I'll do mine too. So we're all live. We're still live. Everybody's here. We'll we'll we can assemble and we'll wait for our moderator. Okay. Great. Good morning, everybody. Oh, wait, I didn't get the memo. What? Oh, about tie? Well, I'm a grown up, man. We wear tie. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, a, it helps to control my blood pressure. You know we're live. All uh, 100 people online can, can see and hear you now, even if we can't see them. <laughs> I know a few of them. <laughs> Nothing like getting dressed down by your boss nationally. <laughs> well, I know Doug isn't watching, so. But I'm sure he'll hear about it. Yeah, Carrie's, Carrie's my boss boss. I know, right? <laughs> Well, so this is day two for us. We have found this part the most um, interesting of assembling a panel together while 100 people are waiting online. Has, uh, you hear has it been pretty seamless, the GoToWebinar for you guys? Like bandwidth consistency and everything? I think so. The technical people who know more are behind the scenes tell you. Hi, Kim, you ready to go? Here we go. Now I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. We got a couple more. Well, you're all here. We can go ahead and get started. Okay. I'm delighted to uh, introduce you and uh, delighted to have Kim Hart from Axios Cities as our moderator. So thank you all for joining us and I'll let Kim take over. Great, thanks, Leslie. Uh, thank you for having me. And hello, panelists. Hello, audience. Um, I am the cities correspondent at Axios. I write the weekly cities newsletter, uh, where I've been pretty focused, uh, of course, the past couple of months on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on communities and cities um, and all aspects of that from budget uh, to uh, specific communities in need to schools to, I mean, literally every aspect of city life has been upended and affected in some ways. Um, and not just city, I mean, rural uh, suburbs everywhere. Uh, and now, you know, the past few weeks, we've had another dimension to add to uh, the, the conversation and the demands on city leaders with the protests and the social unrest uh, and um, what's happening with police departments and the demands uh, to change, make changes there. The topic of today's conversation, of course, is how to rebuild from this in a more resilient way than we were before, what lessons learned uh, leaders have found. And so we have three great panelists here. I'll quickly run through them and then throw it over to We have Carrie Armstrong, who's board chairman of the Atlantic Regional Council. Uh, Danielle Aragani, who is director of AARP Livable Communities. 
And Mike Alexander, director of the Center for Livable Communities, also at the Atlanta Regional Council. Um, so, Carrie, do you want to kick us off with a brief introduction and uh, anything you want to kind of say at the top, and then we'll get going with the others? Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I was flattered to be invited. Uh, I've been a part of the Atlanta Regional Commission for uh, gosh, quite a while now. I guess I'm in my 13th year and I've been chairman. Um, I'm in my seventh year as chairman. Uh, but I think the reason, uh, the secret reason they put me on this panel is that my day job is as an evil commercial real estate developer. And uh, I think uh, the, the, maybe that my perspective from the private sector and the built environment world uh, might lend something to that. Uh, so I'm glad to be here and uh, I will cease for now and let the others speak. Great, thank you. Danielle. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Kim and Carrie and Mike and everyone in the, uh, the NARC world. I'm really happy to be here. Um, we have partnered with NARC in the past, uh, in particular around some of our age-friendly and livable communities work, which is very much aligned with the work that, that you all do every day in your communities. And I'm very uh, pleased to be a part of this discussion today. I think it really is a, a unique moment in time and calls on us to have some pretty difficult and frank conversations um, that ultimately I think will lead to better outcomes for, for all. So happy to be here. Thank you. And Mike. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Alexander. Uh, again, I'm the director of the Center for Livable Communities, and that's really the long range planning functions at the ARC. I'm happy to be here today. I consider myself a NARC groupie, if there is such a thing. So I've been an active staff participant in these programs for years. And of course, like other uh, regional commissions, regional councils, we've been working hard during this pandemic to help our communities. And we're really starting to see the turn. And I wanna talk a little bit about that and what that means going forward and how we can be more resilient, I think, long-term. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and a quick uh, note about format. We'll kind of go into a discussion format for uh, a, a, about 30, 40, 35 minutes or so, and then wanna make sure we have time for Q and A. And then Leslie, I'll, uh, get your help with getting uh, soliciting audience questions for additional conversation there. Um, so to kick things off, uh, Carrie, interested in starting with you. You know, one of the the most obvious changes here has been to how people are working uh, where, and where they're working from. And the obvious question is is if people are working remotely more and more and that becomes a more permanent part of our uh, you know working society and working expectations what does that mean for commercial real estate and since that's your day job would love to get your predictions or what you're thinking about long term and what should city leaders be expecting on that front well i get that question a lot as do all of us in the development community uh and when asked if things will change because of this i can say without with absolute confidence that, yeah, probably. The problem is that it's still early in the movie uh, from our perspective. Uh, we are beginning to see uh, things that may become trends, uh, and we are beginning to uh, uh, try to understand and look in our crystal balls as good as they can be and anticipate the needs ultimately of our, of our customers, our residents, and so forth, because that's what we design everything around. Uh, in our world, it kind of falls into two buckets. One is the financial bucket, the underpinnings of any commercial developments or, or owners. Then secondly is the physical bucket, what is actually built. Uh, with people uh, working from home, I mean, really the majority of people working from home and working remotely, uh, we have learned that uh, it works. Technology has now reached a point uh, where it is uh, workable and affordable and usable and practical. And companies are proving to themselves that in fact, uh, remote working or teleworking um, works and can be an important part of um, what their future might be. Uh, so that some of that's gonna stick. We don't know how much. Um, and uh, we're uh, waiting to see. It's kind of a reverse of the, the trend we had been going through uh, to some degree, but when um, uh, companies were looking more for walkable communities and higher density projects and so on and so forth, uh, interiors with lots of benching, 
<clears throat> and collaborative space and low profile cub cubicles and all of those things. Uh, so this is the opposite of that. And companies are gonna have to understand their cultures and make some difference. And we think uh, inevitably there will be more teleworking uh, that could lead to less need for office space uh, as people actually uh, completely together less uh, regular. Less, uh, regular. Um, and we have to understand that the millions of square feet of office space and things like that that are built uh, may be built wrong. And that depends on how we go forward through the, through the pandemic. Uh, if you look at a typical office building today, how do you address things like uh, restrooms? How do you address things like uh, separation? How do you address things like um, going back to paper from from um, uh, air dryers uh, for hand drying? Um, if people, if if social distancing is going to remain a part of what we do, uh, we don't have enough room to do that. So we're trying to listen to our customers and listen to the world and anticipate uh, what may be next. On the other side of things, it's really too early to tell the financial impact. Um, we're waiting to see, and we learn kind of on a monthly basis, um, if and as companies recover, um, will there be defaults uh, on, on leases? Will there be defaults on loans? Uh, what uh, the obviously the quicker the world can get back to some sort of normal where revenue is, is flowing and commerce is occurring, the better. But what that looks like, who survives, who doesn't, uh, how robust they are, if they survive, is all uh, a question that's going to be answered month by month. So we have to look at it from both perspectives and read the tea leaves. Um, and we and we lag. Uh, real estate's a lagging part of the economy and we'll have to see how it all plays out. Are there areas, Carrie, as you, we think about what makes a community better, more livable, more walkable, more resilient uh, going forward, are there changes that you think are um, needed ones to the real estate, especially commercial kind of downtown office park areas uh, that should be made um, given this chance to kind of maybe go in a different direction? Or have you heard from people of now that we have this this kind of downtime, this turning point, should we be doing something differently in how we think about density, how we, where we build, how we build, uh, what kind of, build, what, how, what buildings look like? Well, those are the, exactly the questions companies are asking themselves. Uh, the trend line had been toward, uh, as I said, density and collaboration, and, and um, but also toward a more livable community, a more walkable community, uh, things where people don't have to get in their cars, uh, things with robust uh, technical facilities, uh, Wi-Fi, all of those things. Um, a lot of that will continue because it makes a lot of sense, but I think the demand is going to be determined uh, over time. Uh, we are hearing some major companies rather than amalgamate into giant headquarters operations, maybe they uh, break up into three or four, uh, even within a metro area, three or four um, uh, separate locations. Uh, the odds of being in four hot spots in a pandemic at once uh, are less than maybe being in one uh, space altogether and ended up in, ending up in a hot spot. Uh, but um, again, it's too early to really tell uh, if there's uh, lessons around any certain idea. Uh, we've done some research and Mike will probably talk about this uh, at, at ARC, uh, talking to our employers in the metro area and surveying, I think, 2,900 people from uh, different levels of management from sea level to down to workers uh, and it's pretty clear that teleworking is going to stick uh, but it's also clear that uh, collaboration is still important and people still believe in face-to-face -face, uh, work so um, the magnitude of how much of that sticks uh, remains to be seen and there are benefits to it we've had wonderful uh, lack of traffic problems for the last two months and our air quality is improving uh, so uh, we'll see how this uh, how this plays out. Great, thank you, uh, Danielle. 
given your position with AARP and the things that you're thinking about, um, how are you, all, what's the discussion within AARP of using this moment to rethink what uh, seniors need, um, given that they have been so vulnerable to the pandemic, especially uh, nursing homes have been hit so hard, access to healthcare, kind of what they're able to do, what, what they have access to in terms of services and help. Uh, how are you thinking about what that population needs and what communities can do better to serve them? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, it, 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 you know, it's such an interesting time because I think just as, as we maybe started to get a sense of what the learnings were from COVID-19, now this this new layer of inequity is is reasserted. It's re, we're being reminded that um, that all uh, access, all amenities, all impacts are not equal. Um, we certainly knew that older adults were more vulnerable to COVID-19 just based on the death rates that we'd seen something like double the rate of, um, of deaths uh, among people who are infected with COVID um, for those who are 80 years and above compared to the general population. Um, we also know that older adults are being hospitalized more from COVID-19, uh, certainly particularly those folks in the 50 to 64 year range that uh, that was where it was really hitting the most. And in some communities we heard from, uh, I was on one of the, the sessions yesterday, Washington County, Texas, I think they mentioned that 24 out of 27 deaths from COVID-19 all were located in nursing homes. So we know there really are these incredible hotspots of vulnerability. Um, but again, we also know that the impacts of COVID-19 are not equally spread among um, race and ethnicity nor income as well. We know that uh, something like five times, uh, Black Americans are five times the rate to be infected uh, compared to sort of non-Hispanic, um, non-white non Americans. And, and so that, that, that the rate of hospitalization varies, the rate of impact varies, and that all really does speak to um, a lot of contributing factors. So um, I think what we're learning from this experience is that there are, in some ways, um, strategies that, that can be deployed that serve everyone. We know that everybody's in need of access to information. Everyone is um, in need of access to um, opportunities to engage with one another. Um, everybody has been isolated from, from family members and friends in stay-at-home orders, but we know that those impacts really do fall most acutely on older adults. Um, so things like access to food has been a really huge issue. Uh, we, we run something called the AARP Network of Age-Friendly States and Communities. It's about 460 communities that have committed to this process of becoming more age-friendly. Many of these communities are counties or, or region, regional entities. Um, but they really committed to thinking about the needs of older adults first and foremost in their planning and their execution. And so we, we kind of surveyed among them to see what, what the responses were that they uh, had put in place, what they had sort of focused on. And we learned definitely access to food was among the most critical needs that older adults um, had. That wasn't necessarily something that our age-friendly communities have been thinking about before COVID. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something that was going to be um, perhaps on, radar people, on people's radar screen more going forward. Um, as I mentioned, access to opportunities to become engaged with one another. So whether that's, um, you know, getting uh, iPads placed in nursing homes or whether that's moving senior center activities online and making sure that our volunteers and older adults know how to use Zoom technology to plug into those events. Um, or whether it's creating new senior academies where, where there's a really sort of intentional, you know, focus around learning and sharing, creating a community of people so that they can stay connected. Um, even while staying at home. Um, that's very important. That was very important before COVID. I think it will be very important after COVID. Um, and then the last thing is just access to information. We've talked about broadband a couple of times, but I think broadband has really become very clearly um, a determining factor in are you able to stay connected, but certainly are you able to even access information? Are you able to stay current with, um, with what's going on in your community and, and how to find those resources that you need? That is something that many of our age friendly communities were working on before. I do believe that it positioned them well to um, pivot their work to be responsive in this point in time. Um, but I do believe that that's going to be something that, that carries forward as well. In terms of the built environment and, you know, the needs that we're seeing around social distancing, um, we know that many people, older adults, younger, you know, younger people, young families, there's a lot of commonality in what people want in their communities. Um, they want to be able to walk to amenities. They want choices in housing. They want choices in how to get around. Um, but this new pressure, this new requirement to have that social distancing is, is, is creating some interesting opportunities in communities, I think, to think about repurposing their public space, roads, sidewalks, parking lots, and the like. Um, parking lots may not be public, but you know what I mean? Like, how do we repurpose this sort of public spaces so that they better um, serve individuals and they better serve local economies and businesses? Um, so we're starting to learn a lot. I think we're going to continue to learn a lot.
question for the next one. Sorry, unmuting myself. Uh, I had a very noisy cat in here a minute ago, so I was trying to spare everybody from, from that. <laughs> um, uh, Daniel, one follow-up question on that is, uh, when it comes to housing for seniors, is there a rethinking going on about uh, what options they are open to them or kind of an aging in place versus, you know, being able to age at home versus going into having not as many options other than to go into an assisted living or a nursing facility, which in a lot of places is the only option for people once they, they reach a certain point and, and need a certain level of, of help around the clock. How are, are, are there new, new models maybe being thought of or considered about where uh, people can can be and and maybe where they're not quite as isolated from the rest of the community, but also maybe not as vulnerable to uh, future uh, sicknesses like this. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that if anything, the COVID nineteen crisis has sort of accelerated and amplified some of the trends we already saw. So in twenty eighteen, we did a survey, um, uh, sort of gauging people's interest in their ability to, to their desire to age at home and age in community. We know that that's very strong. It always has been strong. It remains strong. People want to be able to age in their home and in their community for lots of that makes sense. Um, we also saw a real uptick though in people who are interested in home sharing. Um, and I think that you know the growth in the sharing economy has helped people to think differently about their home, whether that's an Airbnb situation or a roommate situation. There are groups like there's an app called Nest. Really, there are groups like Silver Nest. There are nonprofits that have intentionally put themselves in the position of matchmaking, um, either between older adults or for older adults to live with people who are younger, um, which I think speaks to the interest in not being alone. I think we know the the um, risk of extended periods of isolation and loneliness in ARP we often say that uh, the effects of, of, of prolonged isolation are equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day and there's a very real health effect um, and those people who were again isolated before COVID became more isolated so as people emerge from COVID I think they're looking at home sharing they're looking at maybe how to find a roommate that um, that might both address the economic needs as well as the companionship needs but another area that I would say people are really turning to um, with renewed vigor is interest in accessory dwelling units. And I think the design, the degree to which people are allowed to construct units, um, sort of independent units, whether attached or detached to their homes, those are, I think those are going to, there's going to be a renaissance in that or really sort of a, a, a resurgence of interest in those because it does allow people to um, take care of older adults in ways that might not have been feasible if they lived in a, in a separate home in a different community. Um, I know that I, on the heels of some of the, the worst stories about nursing homes, I promised my mom, you will never end up in a nursing home, don't worry. And I think that that was probably the best thing that she could have heard. Um, it's not to say that all nursing homes are bad, many, many wonderful ones, but I think people want to have options, they want to have choices. And if there's an appropriate level of support that goes along with living at home, I think that um, you know the more that we can find a, a pathway to create more diverse housing choices for people to age in their communities, that that really does benefit everyone. That makes sense. Mike, patiently waiting over there. Um, I know you're the the data guru on this panel, um, and so I guess as a top line question. When you're looking at trends and demographic, um, you know shifts. What are what are you most interested in or watching most closely right now as you're crunching the numbers and looking at the data coming in? Yeah, the, the most recent slide that I'm using in the decks when I'm here in Atlanta speaking is a comparison of recessions and how many months it took in these different recessions from 1948 to now to get back to peak employment. Well, that's not demographics exactly, but it does speak to people and work. And this, this recession is without peer, the downward dive in job losses over the last uh, year over year, 12 months of recorded information. There's nothing like this in American economic history. And to be honest with you, the 2009 crisis took us the longest to recover in American history. It took over 70 months to get back to previous employment levels. We don't want that to happen again. I mean, the title of this presentation is A Resilient Future. And to be honest with you, as we've had these last three recessions, each one has proven harder for us to recover. 
And I think this is a critical thing we have to be thinking about. Um, you know, in, in, our, in our own state, we've already lost over 450,000 jobs. And everyone on this call has similar numbers in their mind. And it's gonna take us a long time to get back to that new normal. So that's, that's something that I'm, I'm critically focused on. We were all surprised by the May jobs numbers that we hit the turn. And so of course I'm reading heavily about that. And of course we know from history that continued financial stimulus is gonna be critical to avoid a double dip recession. And so if there's one thing I'm carrying forward is all the leading economists are saying, man, this is great that we saw an increase in the jobs, but it is far from over. The implications of this on a demand side shock are already there. I know Kerry follows this really closely as well. When we start looking at that type of data, you know, it's going to be that much harder for us to pull out in the way we would like to. Um, and combining that is this health crisis, which is making it all, all, the, all the more um, troubling for us to, to see this economic stability that we'd like. We'd like to have a resilient economy. I think all of us have to look at our local economies and really do the hard work of understanding what makes those economies go. Uh, the state of Georgia's had some of the highest rates of layoffs in the United States, we're 44, right? You would expect um, really recreation-oriented economies like Las Vegas to struggle. They are, Hawaii is struggling because all that activity's gone. Those people are, are hurting, but we're hurting as well. And so I've always said, you know, Metro Atlanta had a diverse economy, but at the heart of it was a, a big airport <laughs> and a big airline. And it, it really hurts to see my friends being laid off. And I hate to get to that personal moment, but it is critical. These are real people around us all that are struggling and we want them to get back to the, the great things that they were doing. You know, I'm a very Atlanta proud person. And so this is hard to watch that airport really kind of silent right now. And it's happened as well in our downtown and the hotel and convention bureau. We weren't, the point is we weren't as diverse as we thought. And this, this has highlighted relative weaknesses. And so when I'm thinking about this going forward, I have very strong German connections and I've been thinking about the word Kurzarbeit a lot. And the German unemployment rate is dramatically less than the United States. And one of the reasons is they, they had a direct system to put money into those their companies and employers so that they didn't have to lay off people in the first place. And so I'm wondering like what that looks like for us long term, given that you know we've laid off over 40 million people in the United States. It's, it's hard to grapple with the idea that 40% of the people in this country making less than $40,000 a year have lost their job. And like the real emotional turmoil and economic turmoil caused by that, and that all these other systems have to adapt, mean that we have to think long-term about the kind of systems to make sure that we can reduce the potential impacts of this. And I've included a deck that um, I'll put into the chat. You know, we've, we've gotten clear warnings about this before, about what a virus would likely do to the US economy. And it's, and it's happened in, in a real way. Our response, I think, on the demographics side, I can't but just really ditto everything Danielle said so beautifully. One of the things I've talked about on demographics for years is the most likely future you have going into old age is a long time. It's a long time. You are likely to be spending often 10 hours a day alone in the last years of your life. And I'm not sure that's the future we want. And I'm glad to hear Danielle talking about alternatives to that as well. In the big data, um, that's been released, especially by companies like Google. The number one change in movement during this crisis has been the use of parks. The one place where people have gone is parks because they couldn't go to those commercial activity centers. They were hungry to get that movement in that they know they needed. The county I live in here in Atlanta, the, the people going to parks is up 61%. And that includes me. <laughs> 
And so um, that that really is something that that we've been paying attention to. Carrie mentioned the teleworking. I'm very proud that the ARC, when we did decide to go home, we could literally the next day start working from home. Everyone had a laptop. Most of us had additional monitors. We were ready to start working remotely. We had the software and computer, computer systems to do that. We saw that our local governments weren't in the same place. We actually have shifted gears and built a whole webinar program now around this idea of making sure our local governments, our core constituency, you know, we could help them as much as possible. We've done trainings on how to do teleworking. Um, there's big slides in that. Carrie mentioned the survey uh, that we did through our Georgia Commute Options Program. One of the most unique things about the ARC is that we manage uh, the TDM program for the state in metropolitan Atlanta. And so we have the responsibility for all the marketing for the alternative commute programs uh, that we do in this state, and using mostly CMAC dollars for people that are in the transportation funding bucket. And that's been really unique. We bought an additional data set that allowed us to email businesses directly. And so to get 2,500 responses on a survey is amazing. <laughs> And yet, yeah, Carrie couldn't be more correct. Our businesses know that they can do this now. And that will be a resilient strength for us, that confidence that we can do the work differently. 69% of the executives that we interviewed said that you know, working from home will be a permanent part of work for their companies going forward. I think that's critical. And so the thing that I've been thinking about is, you know, when you're doing a metropolitan planning organization, transportation planning, you'll hear, really, we had this bifurcated conversation about investing in transit or investing in roads. And people like me never really liked that. It was always more, let's, let's do all the above if we can. But now I think we have to add a third conversation point, and that is teleworking. Because you're all seeing it in your data. We're seeing it in our mobility data. We don't really have a congestion problem right now in Metro Atlanta. Travel's still down in some places over 50%. And so finding the right balance of telework, transit, and road usage through uh, car, cars um, traveling is, I gotta think, I think will be a very important conversation for all of us to have. Telework is here to stay. And I don't think it's gonna, in any way diminish the need to continue paving the roads, to continue expanding critical roads, to building out our transit network as, as it's appropriate. But we're gonna have to think long and hard about what those most critical things are that we want to do, because we are likely in a period long-term where those monies are gonna be less for governments to do that type of infrastructure. Uh, so that's, that's critically where we're focused at the ARC um, right now. The final thing I want to say is we have built a lot of tools for our communities. We, uh, we have shifted gears um, and worked in policy areas that we didn't think we would necessarily work in. Uh, thankfully, we have some people with MPHs, uh, Masters in Public Health. So we have built data tools around case rate data uh, because we want to look at it differently. Carrie has been trained up on how to use those tools so that we can understand in a different way <laughs> from what's being published. Um, what's actually happening in our communities. And so that's been another resource is these additional tools to help our local governments understand what's going on. It is dramatically different that we can get almost daily data on movement down to the zip code um, for our communities. And we built tools that allow you to look at that data so we can see the changes in pattern and see as communities change, the way they're thinking about being open, open what that impact is likely like. And I think long-term, that's gonna be a, a great thing for us. So, I think you're muted, Kim. I think you're muted, Kim. There we go. Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, Mike, thank you for all of that. One follow-up question to something that you said uh, kind of in the beginning of, of your remarks was that 
it, with every subsequent recession, it's harder and harder for us to recover from it. And why is that? Is that because our, our economy is not diverse enough? Is it because the, there's, a, there's a gap in opportunity? Do you have thoughts on why that is the case? Yeah, generally, and there's always nuance in any answer you're gonna give, there's always caveats. Those early recessions really were about America being mostly a manufacturing economy. So if you sent people home from the factories and you decided to turn the factories back on, the majority of people could go right back to work. And so when you start to have recessions that, and your economy, manufacturing jobs shrink as a share of your economy, you become more of a service economy, you become more dependent on consumer spending. If you interrupt that in some fundamental way um, and you slow down that velocity of movement of, of money in the economy, you, it's gonna be harder for you to create those jobs. And you know, and that's the point. If you look at the uh, look at that slide, um, once we post it into the into the chat, you're going to see that um, that difference. And it's about the changing American economy, really. Got it. And a question for for anyone who wants to chime in here. Um, you know, we've talked about the importance of telework going forward. We've also talked about the number of people who make under $40,000 a year who have been laid off and are bearing, um, unfortunately, the a big brunt of the economic collapse here. How do we make sure that when we're talking about resilient communities, that it's resilient for everyone, including the people who can't telework? That's not the kind of jobs that they're in, that they they do rely on an airport like Atlanta's uh, for, for their paycheck. Uh, how, are, how should communities be thinking about helping those people recover and be able to withstand additional shocks going forward since the shocks seem to keep on coming right now. Well, I think it's, you know, again, there, everything is interconnected and there are a lot of, uh, a lot of factors that play into it, certainly mobility and access. Uh, access uh, that's available. Everyone have an echo, I don't know why. Um, I hope the rest of you can't hear that. Um, that that's critically important. Uh, we spent a lot of time studying the, the question of housing affordability uh, and how to uh, address those issues. Uh, sometimes a recession will have a pretty immediate impact on the cost of things. Uh, in, in a downward impact that can actually help affordability, we'll see how that plays out. But all of those things are, are important in um, and making sure that the, the entire community uh, can work, does work, and, and the community works for them. And uh, it really plays into every, uh, every discipline the ARC is involved in, uh, and it's a challenge. We've been spending a lot of time on, on housing affordability. Uh, we have people who can find, at least pre-COVID, they could find a job but it wasn't anywhere near they could where they could afford to live. And so how do we address those issues? So uh, uh, it plays into that. And one thing I wanted to say before I forget uh, that kind of connects something that all three of us have said, for cities and counties, um, in the real estate business, we've learned the hard way that, that you make your money when times are good, but you earn it by what you do when times are bad. And despite a lot of stuff going on and a lot of alligators in the swamp to try to kill, I would encourage everyone to do a deep dive into their uh, zoning codes, into their zoning policies, into their building codes. Uh, if somebody wanted to uh, share a home or have uh, an additional housing component on their house, uh, an in-law suite, a parent suite, whatever you call it, in many of our communities, that's illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, so do the hard work now of, of updating your codes. Uh, we were thinking the other day about public drinking fountains, which we are required to put in every new office building that's built. I don't know anybody that's ever again going to want to use a public drinking fountain in the hallway of a public office building. And things like that. Get down in the weeds, get granular with it, and be ready. Uh, in a way, it's getting out of your own way, and and I would be surprised if 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 any community, uh, city or county in the in the country, didn't do a deep dive into their existing codes. They they I'd be surprised if they couldn't find something 
that is archaic or no longer applicable or just in the way of trying to be resilient going forward? Kim, can I jump on that? Uh, Kara, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And, and I'll use this as a very obvious opportunity to, to do a little self-promotion on behalf of our program. Um, tomorrow, we actually have a document being released that we at, at ARP, the local community team, have developed with the Congress for New Urbanism, which is a group of uh, urban designers and practitioners, architects and the like, who, who focus on um, building great places. The name of our joint publication is called Enabling Better Places, a Quick Fix Handbook for Downtown Neighborhoods. And what it is, is a menu of exactly those kinds of incremental changes that Carrie just described. It is things like looking at your parking requirements, the flexibility for your commercial district. Like, are you allowing people to convert from a restaurant to a grocery? or to use some vacant space as a pop-up, whatever. Like whatever it is that the locality needs to create jobs, to build back the local economy, are you creating the right kind of regulatory structure that would allow them to do that? Um, are you allowing for the kind of flexibility that people will need to modify their home in the way Carrie just described, to let them move into a place that's less expensive or bring in another family member to share costs? Like now is the time to, to look at all of those things. So. To that end, I would, I would encourage people to check out our website, aarp.org slash livable, um, and that document will be uh, will be posted there tomorrow. Mike, I don't know if you had anything to add. Oh, I think you're muted. Mike, normally I like it when you're muted, but please turn your microphone on. <laughs> He's got that jet. Um, the accessory dwelling units, you know, I'm, I'm my first jobs out of graduate school as a land use planner. There really isn't even now a financial model to do that in large numbers. And if you went to a bank and said, I want to build an accessory dwelling unit, what does that look like as a loan package? And, you know, we've added on to our house as a personal example, and I got a turnkey loan that turned into my final mortgage. And it was beautiful. <laughs> And we doubled the space of our house. Um, and so that was that was great. We want to do something similar. I wish America would learn to do that in large numbers. On the affordable housing front, I think that might be the simplest way to add a lot of units into the housing mix in the United States. 76% of the land in Metro Atlanta is single family detached housing. And to use an old John Prine quote, my favorite musician of all time. 50 million Elvis fans can't all be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've created this pattern and now we need to leverage it to, to really create additional space. We need more housing in this country. Even during the last nine years, we weren't building enough. And now this really, this, 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 um, the baby boomers are already there. My generation is getting into this age. You know, we want to get ready to create um, a model that's more sustainable so that we don't have to go into institutionalized facilities is something no American really really wants to do you know this in the surveys um, so we've got to get better at that quickly be more nimble be more flexible in these housing types and Carrie's right the zoning codes were written a long time ago and if you haven't read the color of law you should right and these codes were designed for a specific purpose and now we've got to get more humane about what that means and i think really it's a big conversation that some change is going to be good and it's not going to hurt you because this whole system is built around the idea of what's what's value and people's fears around losing that value and we obviously don't want anybody to lose their wealth we want people to get wealthier but it's really a, a struggle now in most metropolitan areas to figure it out like carrie said on the workforce housing because it's very hard to commute in most metropolitan areas for low-income workers. You want to understand Metro Atlanta? Really, before this crisis, and understand the need for MARTA and the MARTA heavy rail system, go to the station I walk to at 5 in the morning and watch all of those people commuting down to the airport to work, right? And all manner of outfit, flight line crew gear, I mean, they are using that system to get to work in the best way possible. It's such a great resource for them. I'm very proud of it, that we have it. 
um, and we need that to continue. But it's getting that much harder because the price increases in the core have been so dramatic in Atlanta and almost every other metropolitan area. It's very hard to live close to work in most cities on this planet. I do think if I if I could jump in, I do think one of the hopeful silver linings of all of this is that there's it's yet another reminder of how connected all of these issues are, um, and that you know solving for uh, lack of equitable access, solving for um, health impacts, solving for economic growth cannot be solved by one discipline alone. It really requires sort of a comprehensiveness and a thoughtfulness to stitch the right kind of housing mix and transportation mix, um, public infrastructure investment stitching all those together in a way that serves up a more resilient economy. Um, and I think that, you know, in our experience, one of the reasons I think that people are often surprised to see ARP in these discussions at all um, is that we have come to the conclusion that, that we need to be involved in these conversations at a state level, at a federal level, at a community level, because it is very much a determining factor of the ability of our members, people 15 and above, but anyone really, to be able to live their best life at every age. We simply can't expect that people are going to thrive in their later years or at any age if we are not part of the conversation about how to create communities that um, that address those conditions. And I, so I, for me, one of the big takeaways is, as we start to think about how to build resilience is look for diverse stakeholders, look for those folks who you, who you might not have typically worked with, whether it's a health practitioner or a chamber of commerce or a transit advocate or a bike advocate or your area agency on aging, most likely you have issues in commonality. Um, you have shared values and all of us are really sort of required to be at the table together to, to get to where we're trying to go, which is a more equitable future um, or more resilient future for everyone. Uh, Danielle, that's a perfect segue actually to the next question I had, which was, is, what is the role of the private sector here? Um, as you know, that many members of the private sector are struggling too, and trying to making sure that they can stay back, come back to business, or stay in business in the first place. But as we all think about the you know, everyone in the community and their role in making communities better and more livable and resilient going forward, how what is the role of public-private partnerships? And I know that that term is thrown around so much as kind of like the ideal, but how? is there advice that um, any of you can offer for how to actually go about that and finding common ground with those partners that you just mentioned danielle with uh you know with like-minded goals and pursuing them together uh, and hopefully kind of pooling resources and know-how well I'll, I'll give it a shot and i welcome obviously other people chiming in too i mean i, I think it really does start with um thinking about what you want to be as a, as a community going forward. In the last session, just before this one, um, Claire St. Anthony from uh, NLC and uh, Matt Chase from NACO were talking and, and the discussion circled around values and honing in on what are your values as a community um, as, as the sort of driving force to bring all those people to the table. Um, again, I think what we have found to be particularly compelling, and I've been working in the, the smart growth world on and off for 20 so years, but I have, I have found that the frame of demographics and aging can be a very powerful frame to bring people, bring people to the table. Everybody can intuitively understand the challenge that their aging parent is facing or will face. Everyone can intuitively understand, you know, the kind of lifestyle um, decisions that they'll have to make as they themselves get older, or uh, or as they look at other family members, um, you know, aging and what that really means for for the kinds of um, options that are available to us. For that day you can't drive, then what do you do? For that day when you can't maintain your home, then what do you do? So I think by bringing the um, the very um, stark and extreme, frankly, demographic shifts that are underway, one thing I almost always mention, I'll mention here too, is that by the year 2034, we'll be comprised of a country of more people over 65 than under 18 for the first time ever. So we fundamentally have not been designing communities that are preparing for that future. I mean, Mike, you alluded to the, the kind of communities that have been historically planned for and who they've been serving. We have definitely not been creating communities that work well for older adults. So if that is one available frame, that is one available sort of um, North Star, if you will, that I think can bring um, the private sector to the table as well. You know, older adults are a very powerful economic force. They have disposable income, some of them, not all. Um, they're, they're a very powerful voting bloc. They're a very powerful source of volunteers. And those are the kinds of things that make an, an economy thrive. And if you're well positioned to serve them well, um, if you're well positioned to create a community that works for them and works for other ages too, 
then then that's a that's a very positive looking prospect i would say yeah i, I would echo that i think uh you hit the nail on the head danielle it's you know, I, I introduced myself as an evil developer, but the fact of the matter is our, our, our uh, objectives are all aligned. Uh, if any sort of successful real estate investor, you understand that the performance of your investment is directly linked to the quality of the environment where it exists. If it's a strong community, if it has the infrastructure, if it has physical and social infrastructure to attract good workers and good leaders, uh, then your investment's going to be sound. Uh, but if if you're going the other direction, um, it's not going to work. So we all, as developers, have a vested interest in making sure that our communities are good. And we are seldom really the bad guys. Uh, and the, the folks that we talk to in local government, they are never always the bad guys. But if you have a spirit and, a, and an attitude where you can work together to solve problems like do you really need this much parking? Do you really need these water fountains? Do you really need to have overlay districts where everything has to be stacked, orchard, stone, or couldn't it be brick? Uh, I mean, things like that. Uh, everybody tends to want to come to meetings combatively, and there's no need for that. We're all working toward the same, toward the same end, and we're going to have to be better at that universally uh, to really be resilient in the future. Any other thoughts there? If Just a, a quick thought for, for, for cities and, and counties. It, you know, people have asked me, like, well, what should be the economic financial response of governments um, given the jobs layoffs and these other uh, declines? And, you know, I have to be frank when I say some of it's just not scalable. You know, a city of 20,000 people can't stop job can't loss stop. in their community. They just don't have the economic wherewithal to do that. That has to be a national, sometimes global um, response. But I'm, I have watched a lot of our communities do what they can in the best way possible. And I've seen numerous cities in Metro Atlanta start up their own funds to help small businesses in partnership with the Downtown Development Authority or the business um, association in those particular cities. Again, not going to prevent that city from experiencing job loss, but doing their part to really create um, some funds to help specific businesses maybe make it through this. And when I really think about that and step away from it, it's just building that spirit of we're in it together. And that's absolutely critical right now that those moments are happening is something that uh, has really heartened me. Uh, watching this as a as a regional planner to see that happening across our hundred plus communities demonstrate you know America's willingness to work together and help out their neighbor in the best sense and so these public private partnerships are happening all over the United States usually not understood uh, really by the population at large, but really forming these relationships in a way that I think will make our community stronger long-term. Unmuted. Great, thank you. And I know that it's already 1.16 and I wanna make sure that there's time for the questions from the audience. So at this point, I'll, I'd like to pass it over to NARC staff to uh, go with those questions that have been received from the audience. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, just a few questions here. First one, um, there have been some murmuring of pushback against increasing density as a result of the pandemic, yet the rates of infection have not necessarily correlated to communities of higher density. What do you think regions can do to get ahead of this opposition in order to continue and even accelerate emphasis on creating more livable centers, which by nature are more concentrated in order to improve walkability? Uh, you know, I think that trend will continue because um, when somebody takes up residence or reports to work in a, in a, in a walkable community, um, they like it. It's nice. I can actually get to lunch without driving there. Um, uh, I've got open space. I've got good Wi-Fi wherever I want to be. Uh, there's, there's, uh, 
just too many good things about it. And, and really what we're seeing in Metro Atlanta, uh, which is huge and we have a lot of cities and a lot of at least 10 counties in our, in our core, um, we're seeing uh, that trend tend to continue and we're seeing suburban urbanism. Uh, you see livable centers popping up uh, really all around the compass. Um, Mike, what's the statistic? I think 70% of the development in Metro Atlanta uh, in the last decade has been in what we define as a livable center, which is a mixed use walkable community. And uh, those are that's are happening in cities that are 20 miles from downtown Atlanta. So I think that's gonna continue. I think that as we continue to look back on COVID-19, we will identify uh, really kind of super hot spots or whatever the, the phrase is that are, are particularly problematic. And we've talked about uh, uh, senior centers and, and um, assisted living facilities. Uh, food processing operations obviously become uh, a bright blip on the radar. Uh, prisons have become a, blight, a bright blip on the radar, and I, I will understand it better uh, as more data emerges and is analyzed. Um, but I, I think that the bottom line on, on um, the trend toward density and, and more livable communities, I think that's going to I think that's going to continue. I'm not terribly concerned about that. Uh, we learned it on a trip uh, to Plano, Texas. Uh, somebody said uh, the problem that people have with density, it's not about the density, it's about the design. And if you think uh, really creatively and properly about designing a livable center for a community within a community, then it can be successful. Kim, can I jump in here? I think there's, there's, I think that's a great question, and it's something I, I'm worried about as well. Um, but I do think there have been two other trends that have emerged in this pandemic that work as counterforces against that. Um, one is, I think, the the um, awareness of what prolonged isolation feels like, and the fact that um, people actually miss being around other people. There's a natural energy that comes. I think people are drawn to places that attract other people, and that's the second trend. I think is public spaces and parks and the value of those. I mean, Mike alluded to the fact that park use is up in his region. That's certainly the case here. See more people walking and biking than ever before. And I think it's almost like the light bulb has gone on for people that, oh, these are public amenities that belong to all of us and that we value. And I think that as many people know, those work better in communities that are slightly more dense. It, those do not work well in sprawling situations. You don't have that kind of same investment, that same sense of place that can be created in, in more mixed use, more, more compact communities. So um, I'm hopeful that those two balances, at least those two at least balance each out. Um, but I do think that the care is right, that I think what people really want is the kind of place that they can live and where they can walk to places they can bike to places they, they can interact with neighbors um, in a very natural kind of organic way. Yeah, I, I see nothing stopping this trend. It's been so strong. I think there's some financial math behind it. We just haven't built single family in the exurbs. I waited for years for it to come back to the rates before. Uh, the Great Recession, it never did. And in fact, those communities have mentally reset about their growth potential in our exurban counties as a result. And then the, the multifamily pressure in the core of Metro Atlanta and most other metro areas has been dramatic. The vacancy rates have continued to be low for multifamily, dense multifamily and cores. And so the, the capital, as Carrie would say, has been reinforcing that because there hasn't been this spike in vacancy. And that's just good economic indicators of that desire to be in the core. And again, the amenities inside the core of Atlanta have changed dramatically over the last 25 years. If you haven't been to our Beltline, and seeing the activity pre-COVID, you could barely walk down the core trail there. And I would argue there's very few places in the United States with those kind of amenities like we have in Atlanta now, and people wanna be there. And so our other communities are trying to replicate that. Carrie works with some communities up on the north side that are doing their own versions of the Beltline now. And these are suburban communities. So um, 
you know, if we can match the public infrastructure on the park side with high quality development, um, those are going to be the places where people want to be. There's no doubt about it. On that, I'm 100% confident. And the connection between density and the, the topic we said earlier about people <laughs> co-living or having their parents live with them or their children living with them longer, you know, a lot of the zoning uh, codes and, and building codes uh, are written uh, to try to control traffic and density. So, for example, um, you can build a new apartment complex, but you can't build any three-bedroom units. They all have to be singles or, or doubles. Well, a lot of that was invented because of the concern for too many families moving in with school-aged children. And what do you do with the buses and the traffic and all of those things? Well, it wasn't factored in that maybe mom and dad needed that third bedroom. Uh, and that, that speaks to density, it speaks to uh, uh, community and how families are going to have to live and will be living together either by choice or, or uh, because they have to economically. Uh, so it, it's those sorts of things that we have to really reassess with the new goggles on uh, why we do things the way that we do. Great, thank you all. Um, next question, digging into current codes to create cost savings and offset local revenue impact is a great idea. Any other examples beyond drinking fountains? Um, gosh, you just opened the value engineering door for me. This is gonna be too much fun. No, I, I think we just get confused. I mean, a, lo a lot of times uh, uh, when you look at, at ordinances, they are written and they, they tend to pile on. Uh, you know, once there's nothing uh, more permanent than a temporary solution. Uh, somebody will include something in the zoning code and then something happens that either doesn't work or somebody doesn't like for whatever reason. And now there's a, a, a reason to do it that way or not do it. Um, uh, things like um, building materials. Uh, Sometimes it's just language. If I went to you and said, I want to use a cementitious skin, everybody thinks that's hardy plank or, or some kind of, you know, non-durable substance. Well, technology has changed. And uh, there are some very beautiful buildings built out of, uh, out of new materials that you aren't allowed to use uh, because of the codes. Um, requiring um, certain aesthetic treatments um, to, uh, to new housing developments to meet some sort of design standard or, or community aesthetic. Uh, those can be valuable and I fully support uh, the authority of local communities to do what they wish to do with their communities. But don't, con don't talk yourself into believing that that's going to help solve an affordable housing problem. Uh, you have to be open to new ideas. You have to be willing to make exceptions. You have to empower your people to just use sound um, uh, thinking and good judgment as they make decisions and and try to um, think in terms of the purpose of whatever it is you're building rather than the physical look and feel and composition of, um, of what you're building. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. If social distancing continues to be an issue, then think about elevators in high dense urban areas with multi-story buildings. You know, uh, uh, the elevators, the vertical transportation in a high rise is critical. Right now, uh, the elevator cabs are sized so that you can only carry two people at a time and maintain six feet of social distancing. So uh, if that goes on, what does that mean for vertical transportation in buildings? They're gonna be slower, uh, you make exceptions for elevators. Some people say, well, that'll encourage people to use the stairs. Unfortunately, fire code stair widths um, are too narrow for social distancing, unless you're all going one direction, six feet apart. Uh, it, it, there's just a lot of stuff like that we've got to figure out and understand. It'll be awfully hard to add elevators to a building once it's built, um, but we've got to think our way through all of those things uh, as I said before, with, with a new set of goggles where we really look at what happens if this happens again and um, 
are we are we trying to fight the last war or are we trying to overdo our reaction to um what we just went through uh and, and getting out of, out of the sense common sense range when we do it so, uh that's why i think we just all have to work together and figure it out you know, step by step and with uh, new information that come, as it comes in The mute trap. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all. I know it. We're almost done with this. We're almost out of time, so I'll um, close it out. Thank you to our panelists for a really interesting conversation and for letting me have the pleasure of moderating it. And I'm Kim Hart with Axios. Um, I spend my days talking to folks who are at the local level and hearing what they're actually hearing and doing on the ground. Um, so you can reach me at Kim at Axios.com. I'm easy to find. Would love to, to talk to more people and have more perspectives on what your towns and cities are looking like going forward uh, amid all of these challenges. And my newsletter, I will give it a quick plug. You can sign up at signup.axios.com. And with that, thank you again. And I'll turn it over to Leslie. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you, Kim. I know there's a lot to talk about right now, and so I appreciate you taking the time to join us. But this is a really great discussion. I think that we could do it all day if everybody had time. But I think this is just the beginning of the discussion and um, conversation within NARC about how we build on this and we help communities move forward together. So with that, I want to thank you, our panelists. I want to thank our audience for joining us today over the last two days. This will be our last online web, web session. So um, I thank you so much and look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.